Good morning. I thank our Bells of Bron for the beautiful prelude this morning. It is a joy to welcome everyone to worship today. We're so glad that you're here. Hope and pray that uh, this is a day of blessing for you, and we hope that by coming here today it will be. We're glad to have visitors with us today. If you're a guest of our church today, a very special welcome to you. We're so glad that you are here. I'm Clayton Oliphant, pastor of the church, and we welcome you, and we're, uh, again, glad to have visitors. If you're a first-time guest, make yourself at home, and just know that, that we are a loving congregation. We'd love to have you come and learn more about our ministries here at First United Methodist Church Richardson. In your insert in your bulletin today, there's a... Um, information about United Methodist Women. Their 150th anniversary celebration is today. And that's an amazing organization. It's a mission-driven organization. And it is a, an amazing organization that has done so much good throughout the world for so many people. And we're having a, a celebration today in Coleman Family Hall. We invite you to go by. They're having cake and punch and information about United Methodist Women. I hope that you'll go by and support and celebrate what they're doing. Let me also encourage you as I'm doing the announcements, go ahead and uh, start the attendance registration pads and pass those along so that everyone has a chance to sign in, both members and guests. Uh, on the uh, back of your bulletin, you'll see a lot of information there, some great information about things coming up. We're, we're approaching the Easter season, and uh, some amazing opportunities are coming up. We hope that you'll be aware of those opportunities. I also wanted today to celebrate with one of our staff members. Uh, Reverend Julie Richter is with us this morning. Julie, stand up. Let us just say hi to you. She is... Um, Julie has uh, just got married last weekend, so we wanted to celebrate her, her marriage to Kyle Henson, and she is now Reverend Julie Henson. Uh, unfortunately, Kyle works in Nashville, and he's a musician in Nashville, and they're going to be moving to Nashville together um, very soon, and she'll be with us a few more weeks. She's led our modern service for, for the last few years and done an amazing job with that, and we're so grateful for Julie and her ministry among us, and we'll have other opportunities to say goodbye, but we just wanted to congratulate you today. Congratulations. There's a church in the Nashville area that is very, very fortunate to have, have her coming to join their staff uh, in, the next, in, the, in the next couple of months. We, um, we're blessed to come together today. We're in the, our series called The Greatest Story, and we're glad that you're here today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand as we sing our praise to God.
I'm smiling because uh, I used to pastor a little country church, and we would sing that song just about every month. And so as we're singing it here today, all these memories came flooding back. Um, Just gives me goosebumps. (laughs) Will you join your voice with mine as we say together, the call to worship is printed in the bulletin. I'll take the Roman and you take the bold. Our surprising God has an uncomfortable habit of showing up where we least expect God, in a burning bush, in the face of an enemy, in a livestock feed trough, on a rough wooden cross. May our lives be turned upside down with God's radical love. Help us fully to God's surprises, even as we revel in the joy of being fully embraced by God's all-encompassing grace and mercy. We find ourselves once again surprised by the limitless and inexplicable nature of God's love, and we rejoice to stand together on holy ground. As you're being seated, we want to invite the Caesar family forward as Brooklyn comes to be baptized this morning. Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Brooklyn, on behalf of the church, I wanna ask you these questions. Do you truly and earnestly repent of your sins and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord? and in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Do you desire to be baptized into the Christian faith? Will you then obediently keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all the days of your life? Family, will you continue to support and uphold Brooklyn in her, in her faith? Brooklyn Nicole, we baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm not going to pick you up, okay? (laughs) I just want to, can I show you to the choir here? You wave to the choir. All right. I want to turn around because I want you to see your family here and what a special day this is for your family. And, um, and this is your family. It's a big family. All these people are part of this family, and they are celebrating with you today your baptism. And your baptism gives you an identity that you're a child of God. That's always been true, but we've just outwardly affirmed that through the water. And so we want you to know you're a child of God always, today, and forever. And if you ever forget that, these people right here and these people right here and all these other people, they're going to be here to remind you that your true identity, you're loved by God, you're precious and a child of God, right? Let's come down for a family blessing. The Holy Spirit work within you, that being born by water and the Spirit, you may ever be a true and faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Church, we have a, a responsibility to walk with those who are baptized in our midst and to help them grow in their faith. 
and grow in, in the knowledge and gra of, of God's grace. So we, we say a vow together, and this vow that we're going to have on the screen is our way of saying we're here to do whatever it takes for, as a congregation for Brooklyn and other baptized members among us to grow in their faith and to, for us to, to exhibit the qualities of Christ-like love to one another so that she may also grow in that, in that same Christ-like love. So let's join together now in this pledge. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that Brooklyn Nicole, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith, <coughs> confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal.
most sacred and wondrous love. Well, you're going to have to bear with me as I go into our time of prayer. I didn't quite expect to get as emotional as we all seem to be in Brooklyn's baptism. As you can probably tell, she is someone who is very special to, to many of us on staff. Um, and Clayton, I used your Bible, or not your Bible, your hymnal, because um, I don't use the hymnal that often. Um, but when I was turning to the baptismal covenant that uh, we were reading just a few moments ago, uh, I turned to uh, the hymn, Joy to the World. <laughs> and as we were talking about Brooklyn this morning um, in our clergy roundup as we get ready for worship, she was described as walking joy. And so it is a good and sacred day and a wondrous day to celebrate God's sacred and wondrous love. And that commitment that we made to Brooklyn today to encourage her and to challenge her and to be an advocate for her as she witnesses to God's love in her life, as we become a witness to God's love in our own lives. The good news for us is that that is not just a promise for Brooklyn, that is a promise for each and every one of us. What a sacred and holy covenant that we take part in. And we come to this place, this beautiful place on Sunday mornings, a place that is not only beautiful, but sacred. It's a refuge. It is a holy place. And we go to God now during a time of prayer as a community. There are prayer blankets on both sides of our sanctuary for those who have asked for our prayers this morning. And if you haven't had a chance to yet already, I invite you to go by those prayer blankets after the service and look at the name on those blankets and say a prayer and tie a knot that the person receiving that blanket may see every single knot around the fringe of that blanket and know that there are so, so, so many people that are praying for them. There are many people who have asked for our prayers this morning, additional names that are on the screens, as well as an extended list that is outside the doors of our sanctuary. I'm grateful to be part of a community of faith that believes in prayer and believes in praying for one another because that is how we stay connected to God, connected to God's love for us and our love for one another. Will you join me now as we go to God in prayer? Let us pray. Good and gracious God, God of covenant, God of liberation and freedom, we confess today, God, that sometimes we feel trapped or we feel stuck, stuck in our fears, stuck in our doubts, stuck in our shame, stuck in our grief. And yet we come into this place today, oh God, and we remember your freedom, the freedom of your love and your grace. May that not just be words to us today, oh God, but instead a call to action, to step out of those places of doubt and fear, that we might be startled <laughs> caught off guard and liberated by your love. Help us to lay down our burdens. Help us to lay down our shame. Help us to lay down our excuses and hear your voice calling to us to go, to love, to serve. We thank you today, O oh God, for the scriptures, for the stories in scriptures, and for the way in which those stories are intertwined with our own. And so as we hear the story in scripture today, O oh God, of liberation and freedom, may we know that is the mark of faith and the mark of freedom on our own lives as well. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love. And it is through God's love, through our Savior's love, and through the confidence that we are God's children, that we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray by saying, our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We invite the ushers to come forward now to receive our morning tithes and offerings. We pray that you give generously to the life and ministry of this church. You may give as the offering plates go by, or you may give electronically online.
amen and amen. Children, will you please come to the steps and let us share children's time together? Won't you come? a couple of weeks ago, some of you may have been here and we were talking about the beginning of the greatest story with the creation. And I challenged you to go stand out in the yard with your shoes off. Does anybody remember that? No, well, guess what? We're gonna do it today. You ready for this? If you're willing, take off your shoes. Anybody gonna do it? Come on. Take off your shoes and put your feet right on the ground and squish your toes around. I want you to feel it. Do you feel the ground? So today we are going to hear um, part of the story of Moses. Now, some of you may remember Moses' story started when he was in a basket on the river and the Pharaoh's daughter found him and then raised him in the palace, right? And he grew up in the palace. And then one day he got really mad at somebody who was one of the Egyptians. And he was treating one of the Israelite slaves really poorly. And he got so mad and he killed the Egyptian. So he ran away from the palace and he went to live somewhere else. He was afraid he would get in trouble. He was embarrassed that he'd killed someone and he just went to hide. And he was living out in the fields, in the hills, raising sheep. Now, one day, guess what happened? He was out in the fields and all of a sudden there was a burning bush and it didn't burn up. It just continued to be the fire. And then it said this, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And then God spoke to him through the bush. And God said, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. So Moses took off his sandals. He was standing on the ground. And God said, I want you to go to Egypt and free my people. Now Moses wasn't really sure about that. He thought, why me? I've done some bad things. I'm just a shepherd now. I don't know. But guess what? God said, you tell them God sent you. And he said, who do I say? I am who I am. Now, I think the take off your shoes part is super important. Sometimes we just go, oh, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground, right? But here's why I think it's really important. If you take off your tennis shoes or your high heels or your cowboy boots or whatever it is, and it's just your feet touching the ground, you remember God is with you. And when you go out into the world, no matter where you go, wherever you step, guess what you're standing on? Holy ground. Because God is there and you are there with God. So this week, I challenge you again, take off your shoes more often and go stand on the ground and feel the ground under your feet and remember that you are connected to God and God is with you always. Let's say a prayer before we go. Amazing God, thank you for a burning bush where you speak to your people. Be with us in every step we take so that we remember you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, if y'all wanna carry your shoes, carry your shoes back and put them on at your seat. Feel free. (laughs) Our text today is from the third chapter of Exodus. It's the beginning of the liberation story 
of the people of Israel, beginning with the very first verse. Feel free to follow along on the screens or with your pew Bible or with your device. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, and yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. And then he said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Pastors are always looking for stories. And a friend of mine told me a story this week. Um, It's about a pastor that was so busy that he decided that, you know, with new technology, with scientific knowledge, that he could actually... You know, he had a, a friend who was a scientist. He could clone himself in order that he could then play golf more often and the clone could fill in for him and the clone could, you know, like go to the hospital and, and meet with people and, and go to meetings and preach and do all these things. So, you know, Sunday morning came and he went to play golf and the, the clone preached for him. Everything went great except for one thing. The clone had this really bad habit of saying profane words. And so the preacher started getting in trouble because the, the clone, everywhere the clone would go, the clone would, would say these obscenities and, and you know, go to the, make a hospital visit and say the most inappropriate things and say these profane things. And he'd go to a meeting and, and at the meeting the, the clone pastor would say these terrible things. And so the pastor started getting in trouble, and he said, I don't know how to get out of this situation, but this is not good. I've got a, a flawed uh, clone here, so I, I need to go. And so he, what he did, he, he went up to a 14-story parking garage, and he took the clone up there. He said, I want you to see the view of the city from here, and, and then he just he pushed him off. He was arrested, of course, and the charge was making an obscene clone fall. <laughs> Nobody? No. Obscene clone fall. Again? Again? Yeah, yeah. I didn't say it was the great story. I just said it was a story. So, how do you recover from that? Um, I could talk about my brackets, which are busted, but I think I'll move on. You know, we're really in this series called The the Greatest Story, and uh, that was not the greatest story, but what we're talking about is the greatest story, and the greatest story is these stories from Scripture. We started with creation, the idea that, that God made everything that is and that we are God's creations, that we are not just random accidents, that God put us here with purpose, with meaning that our lives matter to God, that we were made in God's image. Every one of us, male and female, created in the image of a loving God. We talked about covenant, how this, this 
creating God has chosen to be our God, to be faithful to us, to be our God in, an, in, in all situations, uh, through all of the ups and downs of life. God is with us. God is our covenant God. God will never, never be unfaithful to the covenant. Nothing can separate us from God's love. We, we talked about those ideas, and now this big idea, and this, this story today is really, it, it, it points to the, the definitive story for the Jewish people. It's the definitive story of God's liberation from slavery. It, for the Jewish, our Jewish ancestors, it is the definitive story of faith. For us as Christians, this is one of the most important stories of our faith because it, it has uh, it, its, its own overtones in, in the Jesus story, the story of, of salvation and liberation and freedom that we find from the slavery to sin. And so we begin with this, this story of, of uh, the Israelite people in slavery. How did the Israelite people get in slavery? Because um, they had multiplied in the, in the land of Egypt under Joseph's time there. Joseph was second in command of the Pharaoh. Joseph was an Israelite who had come to Egypt because of the, the circumstances of his life that had brought him there. And he'd risen to the second in command of all of Egypt. And under his... Under his leadership, um, Egypt flourished, and, and many, many um, Israelite people ended up coming there, and they beca- became numerous. And they became so numerous that, that Pharaoh, a new Pharaoh, rose up who did not know Joseph. He did not remember who Joseph was and what Joseph had done for them. And so a new Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph, and he saw that, that the people were... were a multitude of people, and he was afraid and frightened by the the multitude of, of of the Israelite people in Egypt, and so he began to suppress them, and he put taskmasters over them, and he enslaved them and forced them into to, to labor. They were slaves in this foreign land, and so you know they they suffer in that way, and then Moses comes along and Moses is miraculously saved as a child. He's a he's an Israelite child, but he's raised in the Egyptian palace in Pharaoh's palace. And then one day as a young man he sees one of his own people being treated so harshly by one of the taskmasters and he kills him in anger and he flees and he goes away from all of that that misery and that pain of seeing his people in, in slavery and God speaks to him out of a burning bush and so you have this amazing story we read today of, you know this take your shoes off moment where, where God appears to Moses and calls Moses to do something he says I want you to go to Pharaoh and say let my people go and Moses has all kinds of excuses why he can't participate in God's plan but finally God convinces him to, to do this and so he, he goes and he's not sure what to do, but he, he goes and he represents God to Pharaoh and tells him, let my people go. And Pharaoh's heart is hardened, and he will not do that. And so ten plagues come, one after another. Ten plagues come upon, upon Egypt. And after the tenth one, Pharaoh finally says, I'll let your people go. And so the people gather up, and they're leaving Egypt to go to the promised land and they're they're leaving that land and Pharaoh changes his mind and his army is coming down them down upon them and and there's only the the Red Sea in front of them and Pharaoh's army behind them and there's no hope for escape there's no hope for freedom and then God acts through Moses to part the waters and they, they go through the waters to their freedom. And when Pharaoh's army enters that same place of water, the Red Sea, the water closes in on them and drowns the army. And the, the people are miraculously saved. And they go on to wander in the wilderness and finally get to the promised land. And so this story of liberation of how God liberated the people from slavery is at the heart of the faith. It's a story about how God acts in our lives 
to, to um, bring us from something to something for something. So God takes us from where we are in slavery, whatever form of oppression or sin or slavery that we're in, to take us to something better, a better way of living, and that's for something, for a purpose, in order that something good might come, in, in order that something positive may happen. So I, 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 this story is, is an amazing story, and it's at the heart of our faith. And it, again, it goes all through the scriptures, because when you get to, to Jesus, it, the story is how Jesus has come to liberate us from our sins. And through his death on a cross, we, we, we know that it's like that, that miraculous victory through the Red Sea, that God has acted in this way to bring salvation to God's people. And so um, we have this story of slavery and liberation that's at the heart of the gospel. So there's several things about this story that I would just point out to you today that I think are important in, in thinking about this idea of slavery and liberation that's, that's so much a part of our lives and our story. And, and the first thing is to notice that God hears the cries of suffering. Did you notice that in the story? God hears the cries of suffering. In verse 7, uh, here in chapter 3, the Lord said, I have seen the affliction, the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. I know their suffering. So important for us to, to know this. There are times in life when we feel like we're all alone. You ever been in that place where, where the pressure of life had built up upon you and, and you felt like no one in the world could understand what you're going through? You ever been in a situation where, where you were caught in a, in a, in a pattern and an addiction and you wondered, how in the world do I ever get out of this? And you cry out and you feel like no one hears you, you're, you're going through life and, and you're, you, you come up against some unspeakable tragedy and, and you cry out and, and, you know, people care for a little while and then they drift away and you're still there dealing with the, the aftershock of this tragedy and you wonder, does anyone hear my cries? Does anyone know my suffering? And here's this word from the Bible that tells us that God hears the cries of God's people. Somebody may need to hear that today. God hears your cries. When you feel broken, when you feel lost, when you feel hopeless, you're not hopeless because God hears that pain in your heart. God hears those cries. God is aware of what you're going through. God is attuned to your suffering. You think about what's going on in the world this week. I've been reading about the floods in the Midwest and the, the incredible, you know, uprooting of life as these historic floods, you know, have happened in the Midwest and, and more expected to come and to know God hears the cries. I was also reading about Mozambique and the cyclone that hit Mozambique and Zimbabwe and the, the lives that have been uprooted, thousands of people whose lives have been lost or uprooted, changed and transformed forever, communities wiped out. Who cares about them? Well, God cares. God hears the cries. A young teacher in our Richardson School District this week lost her life. One week after giving birth to a child, she loses her life to cancer. And we wonder why and how. And we have to know God hears the cries. God hears the pain. 
when we experience those broken moments of life and we feel all alone, we're not alone. We have this God who hears and is attuned to our misery, our suffering. And, and, and here's the good news. God doesn't stop with just being a good listener. God doesn't stop with just being a good listener to hear us. God moves. God acts. God moves through people. God moves through life situations to, to bring people into our lives. God reached out to Moses and said, Moses, I need you to go. My people are in pain. My people are in misery. And God sends Moses to go to say, let my people go. So God is at, at work and liberating people. So God not only hears our cries, God liberates people from their pain. God is a God of freedom who is seeking to, to reach into the brokenness of life to, to free us, to not only hear where we are, but to lead us to a better place, a place of healing and a place of hope. That's that promised land that we, we all look for, that promised land that we would like to get to, that, that place where, where our lives are, are different than they are today. So God takes us from where we are to a, a new place. God's desire is to help us move, and God puts people in our lives to help us move in that direction. That's why one of the reasons the church is here. The church is here to, to come alongside the broken and to help people in their oppression, to, to move toward freedom. That's what we're about. And, and that's what, you know, when you hear this, it says, I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. God is not content just to, to hear their suffering. God is moving to liberate them. God is a God of liberation. And wherever there is suffering, wherever there is oppression, wherever people are in bondage, wherever people are, are held back by slavery to sin and death, God is trying to move in their lives to set them free, to thrive as God created them in God's image to be. So you have this, this movement that God is at work in your life and in my life to set us free from that which enslaves us. How do we participate in this story then? How do we become a part of this story? Instead of just reading this story, how does it become a part of our lives? So when we say yes to God and we say, God, I want to be part of the healing of the world. I want to be part of the freedom that I've, I've experienced from you. I want to share that freedom with others that good news with others. And so we begin to move in our own lives and look around our world and to see where there's suffering, where there's brokenness. We have members of this church who've been involved in an organization called New Friends, New Life. And New Friends, New Life is attacking modern day slavery, sex trafficking, and trying to help people come out of that situation, out of that darkness into, into a new life with new friends, with, with new hope for their future. And, and it's amazing to see when, when people escape that, that slavery, which is what it is, slavery, to, to come out of that into the freedom to be who God made them to be. You know, there, there are people that, that are in our church that are working in addiction recovery in different forms and fashions, through 12-step ministries and, and other ways, that our, our church is concerned that people are, are caught in the slavery of addiction to alcohol or drugs or pornography or, or debt, gambling, whatever it might be. There's, there's an addiction that, that takes place, and, and, and we believe that that God is able in ways that we are not able to break the, the chains of addiction. That God can and we can't, so we let God do that. We turn our lives over to God and let God bring the healing. God being our strength that we don't have. And, and when that happens, when you see people break free from that and, and begin to fight that battle and to, to live 
in a new way, it's an amazing thing to see. The transformation that God can bring in people's lives when they are set free from that slavery. So you have to look at your own life and, and look, what is it that's, that's keeping you from, from being the person God created you to be? What is it, what sin is, is in your own life? What habit is in your own life that's keeping you from being what God has created you to be? What is that which enslaves you? And do you not know that God hears your cry and knows your burden and wants to help set you free? That God is at work in your life to to free you from that burden, that you might live as God intended you to live, and that we are then called to, to, to look around our world and to look into those, those situations where there, there's oppression, where people are treated as second-class citizens or people are, are broken by life and how we can help them move from where they are to where God would have them be in order that they may live in freedom and hope that's why the church is here, to be part of God's liberating good news. It's the good news that Jesus came to, to tell us about. It's the good news that, that Jesus died on a cross and was raised again that we might live and participate in. It is the good news of freedom and deliverance and liberation. It's not just a story on the pages of the Bible. It's a story on the pages of our lives. It's a story that is about our transformation, how God takes our brokenness and leads us toward healing and freedom and salvation. In the 1700s, there's a story about a slave trader, the captain of a slave ship who, while he was in port in England, stumbled drunkenly into a Methodist revival meeting and he heard about the power of God to transform lives and he felt convicted of his sin. He'd seen the misery of those slave ships. He'd seen the, the, un, the inhumanity of those slave ships and he was sickened by what he'd chosen to participate in in life. On his knees, he asked for God's forgiveness and mercy, and he felt an overwhelming weight lifted from him like nothing he'd ever experienced before. He became a priest in the Church of England and joined with William Wilberforce and John and Charles Wesley and others who were fighting the slave trade in England, and he became best known for a song that he wrote. His name was John Newton. And he wrote those words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. His story has been replicated throughout the ages in people's lives, lives that have been transformed by the power of the good news of liberating love a love that reaches into the, the bondage that we experience and breaks the chains that we might live as God intended us to live in freedom, in liberating love. This is the good news of the greatest story and it's a story that someone, someone needs today. And part of our role as a church is to go into the community and to see those people in chains and go help them break those chains with the power of God's love. Let's pray together. God, we're grateful for your greatest story. We're amazed by the way that you work in our lives and the way you work through history how you have saved people in the past and how you continue to save people today and how you work through the ordinary and the extraordinary to accomplish your means. Forgive us, Lord. Set us free. 
We pray that you would reach into our hearts this day and hear the cries of our hearts. And we pray that you would lead us to that place that you have for us. A land that is rich in promise and possibility in order that we may not only live in freedom but share freedom with others. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. There's some, someone here today who would unite with our church family by your profession of faith in Christ or by transfer of your membership to our church from another. Our doors are open. We'd love to have you as part of our church family. Two ways to do that this morning. One is to come forward during the closing hymn and be received here at the chancel. The other is to go to our joining room, which is right down the north hallway, and one of our pastors will be there right after worship t today to receive you and welcome you into our church. Either way, we'd love for you to come. Let's stand as we sing our praise to God. Let's go forth into the world this week and see where there's hurting. Attune our ears as God attunes God's ears to the misery and pain in the world and let us be there and tell people and show people the good news that God is freedom. In him there is no darkness at all. Let's go live in that light and share the power of liberating love through Jesus. Amen.